Okay, well, good afternoon. I know it's hard to be the fourth speaker in the afternoon, and I'll try my best. Uh, it's a pleasure to be again with this uh, beautiful audience, and thanks for Hans and Gucci for having me uh, again. Um, and, well, Islam and capitalism, that's my topic, and I have just written a book about this. It will be published in six months, so be warned in advance. It will come out, uh, come out at some point. Um, and this is, a, this is a controversial topic, and I'm, actually, if you go and ask many Muslims, I'm a Muslim, uh, but like, ask most of them, like, what do you think about capitalism, you will generally get a negative answer. Uh, because when they hear the term capitalism, they will think of you know, greed and materialism and selfishness, moral corruption, moral laxity, sex and the city, and all that. So that's kind of a pejorative, I think, description of capitalism. I mean, there are some things in capitalist societies maybe a very conservative, pious Muslim might, might dislike, but whether that's a product of capitalism, or whether that is capitalism itself, is I think an issue to be discussed. Uh, of course, also Muslims have a concern with secularization, and when I say secularization, I don't mean the secular state. State is good if it's secular, it is good, it is, I mean, it, it is good, it, the smaller it is, the better, and it's fine if it's secular. But secularization of the society and the individuals, of course, every pious religious Muslim have a concern about that, but whether capitalism really secularizes, or is it the welfare state in the modern age which secularizes, that's, I think, it's an important topic to be discussed and rediscover. we thought maybe some of the Muslims who think capitalism is the you know, uh, root of uh, all evil in the modern world. Um, so if you just get away with that pejorative description of capitalism and come back and describe it as uh, the economic system in which individuals have private property and the right to have economic activity, entrepreneurial uh, like efforts and all that, does capitalism in that sense is compatible with Islam? And my answer is yes. And I think it's also an important answer because actually when you look at the economic history of the Islamic civilization and when you compare with the uh, history of Islamic thought, you see that the rise of Islamic capitalism, and there is one, I'll explain, corresponds to the more liberal and rationalistic era in the Muslim world, and the decline of Islamic capitalism corresponds to the stagnation of minds and the rise of religious bigotry. Uh, as Professor Stone you know, wisely noted in the Ottoman Empire, that you know, there were some people who said, you know, God doesn't like, you know, astronomic work, so you should close it down, but there was an age in Islam, an earlier age, where actually astronomy and other sciences were done in the name of Islam and with an inspiration from Islam. So bigotry comes out of religion, but also sometimes creativity comes out of religion. And why was the case in Islam this way or that way? That's a very important topic. Okay, let's go back to the beginnings. In the, in the beginning, of course, there was, the Pro there was Prophet Muhammad. Uh, there are many founders of religion, well, at, at least several in the world, um, and none of them was a businessman, but Prophet Muhammad was. Before he became a prophet at the age of 40, he was a successful merchant in Mecca. Mecca was the center of actual trade in Arabia. Uh, and, of course, he started receiving revelations according to the Islamic faith, at the age of 40, and those revelations formed the community, a very strong emphasis on monotheism, uh, in the face of idolatry, the rejection of idolatry, and that community became the Muslim community, and you know, it flourished and it became an empire in, in a century. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's what everybody knows in history. Uh, w what was significant that the fact that Prophet Muhammad himself was a merchant, and most of his close aides, and the first Muslims who joined him were actually merchants, uh, can be traced uh, in the very positive attitude towards trade in early Islam. There are sayings of Prophet Muhammad, uh, like ten, uh, nine out of God's uh, ten bounty comes from trade. Or a tradesman is as honorable as the marchers, and, and, and they're the prophets, uh, they're the friends of the prophets. There's even a hadith who says, who makes money pleases God. Hadith is a saying attributed to Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and lots of traditions are like that uh, in the earlier recordings uh, of the Prophet's life and the way he looked at the world. Uh, 
And there's an interesting incident actually. In one case, his fellow Muslims come to the Prophet and they complain from the prices in Medina, the market in Medina. And Medina was the second city, you know, he migrated from Mecca. They said, you know, the prices are too high, can't you fix the prices? And he says, no, only God governs the market and God fixes the prices. Today, some more, you know, free market minded Muslims look at, back at that and see some invisible hand, you know, you know, theology there in, in that statement. Uh, and well, that's of course the Prophet's life, and there's of course the Quran, more important than the Prophet himself. There is the Quran as the scripture of Islam, uh, and of course, well, maybe this is Islam 101, but Quran is so central to Islam that it cannot even be compared to the Bible. It is even higher than the Bible. It is compared to, if you speak in Christian terms, to Jesus itself. It is the Word of God. Uh, so, in that sense, Quran is very central. And when we look at the Quran, again, we actually see a very positive attitude towards economic activity. Uh, like, I won't go into all the details. One of the experts who really wrote a very interesting and important book on this topic was the French Marxist, Marxin Rodinson. He has this classical book, Islam and Capitalism. It's an old book, but it's really a, it's still a very good book. And I would suggest you know, that book strongly for anyone who's really interested in the topic. And Rodinson really studied the Quran in detail and the language and all that. And he says, this is a very pro-business book. Uh, to quote one of his you know, uh, anal anal analytical sentences, he says, the Quran does not merely say that one must not forget one portion in this world, it goes so far as to mention commercial profit under the name of God's bounty. Again, the idea that you make money, you invest, and you, that, and you, you create wealth is praise in the Quran, and that's praise as the way God gives his bounty and his, and his uh, blessings uh, to, to, to people. It should be also interesting to mention that the longest verse in the Quran, which is about a page long, uh, Baqarah 282 in the second chapter is about a loan contract. It's about how to properly sign a contract, how many witnesses should be there, and you know how should we pay it back, and so and so. And and these things were uh, led, led to the scot the scholars of the Sharia, Islamic law, to be very business minded again. Uh, when you look at actually uh, what we call Sharia is a dirty word, I know that, and you know, that there are some reasons for it because of the corporal punishments, which are, in my view, uh, which should be taken not literally and which should be seen in its own context. But many Muslims insist on taking them literally today and bringing them, bringing those corporal punishments. It's, it's like bringing English common law of the you know seventh century to the modern era, and it, it sounds, it looks a little you know violent. But it was good in its age. And I think the same thing can be said for the Sharia. Uh, and b based on the, Quor the Quranic emphasis, Sharia scholars, and uh, most of the Sharia is developed post-Quranic. I mean, there are basic principles on the Quran, so scholars create those principles and make them into, uh, take those principles and make them into laws, specified laws. And there's a strong emphasis on property rights, that no one can come and confiscate your property. And also that was important that Sharia was rooted in the divine and not the political authority. Uh, in the Islamic civilization, Sharia became to what in the Western world is called the rule of law. Since it was made by the religious scholars who were independent from the Sultan, the political authority, it constrained the Sultan. And the best example of this was in the Ottoman Empire when the Sultan dared to do something unacceptable, like establishing a new tax or, or doing something unjust. Masses would march saying, we want Sharia, which means we want justice. So that, that is the core of that you know, yearning for the idea of Sharia, I think, in the Islamic world. It's basically something which was above the political authority and which even dictated to the political authority something which is considered as just. Well, anyway, that's another topic. But it's, let's come back to the Quran and its idea of you know, e economic uh, activity. Uh, there's also an interesting verse in the Quran, and I think Islamic socialists generally overlook this verse. It all it says that there are economic inequalities in the world, and it is not necessarily a bad thing. It says, "Is it they who apportion thy Lord's mercy?" 
We have apportioned among them their livelihood in the life of the world and raised some of them above others in rank that some of them may take labor from others. Which, in my view, suggests that the fact that there are some people are one, one person is a boss and the other one is working under a boss is not something that God abhors. It is the way that God formed that some people will, will be taking labors and some God has given more blessing to some people than others. But at the same time, the Quran takes great emphasis to emphasize, sorry, great, takes great pain to emphasize that the rich have a moral duty to care for the poor. Uh, and that emphasis has led some Muslims to, in the modern world, to discover some sort of Islamic socialism. Whereas I think, and others think, that it is a moral duty. It's not a collectivization of wealth, but it tells the uh, people who have wealth to be, to use some of their wealth to help the poor. And in that case, that would be equivalent to what is called in the West charity. Uh, and after the Islam institutionalized that charity by making zakat, the money given to the poor, by one of, one of the five fundamental pillars of the faith. So there is certainly a compassionate, uh, a caring you know, cap idea of a capitalist, but a capitalist by its nature is not against the idea uh, that, that the principles we find in, in Quran and the Hadith, the, the Prophet's tradition. Now, these principles, these basic you know, ideas in the Quran and the Prophet's life, uh, of course, these unfolded into history within the Islamic civilization. And when you look at the Islamic civilization, the first centuries are an amazing success in a political sense, in a military sense, and in a cultural, in a scientific sense, in all that. Uh, Islam, right after its beginning, you know, became a great empire in a century. The people who joined the empire, or the, the conquered peoples, they were not forced to convert into Islam, so Christians and Jews could remain, not as equal citizens, but protected second-class people, but they had their religious rights to you know, live under Islam. And that's why still, you know, throughout the Islamic world, you still have non-Muslim communities, uh, and in places like the Ottoman Empire, you know, churches and you know, synagogues continue to exist. Uh, well, that's another story, but in one of the key dynamics of this successful civilization was again trade. Uh, there was two reasons. One was the one was the idea coming from the Quran that trade is a good thing, uh, and second was the lucky place of the Islamic civilization. The, the, it was at the root of the world trade routes. It was at the center of the world trade routes between the between India and the Mediterranean and Europe. Uh, uh, and so the Silk Road and all that. So uh, Islam flourished thanks to being at the very center of the world's most important trade routes. And interestingly, Muslims, Muslim scholars, some of the makers of the Sharia were actually merchants themselves, like Abu Hanifa, the founder of the four of the Sunni schools, the more liberal among the Sunni schools, uh, to which most are subscribed to the Hanifi school. He was a merchant himself. And these also uh, scholars developed some techniques or some legal devices to institutionalize free market. One thing they created was an idea, was a system called muhatara. This was a way to go over with the ban on usury. The Quran, I should have noted that the Quran bans and condemns usury, but whether usury is equal to interest in the way we understand today, that's a big question. It has been a question for ages, it's still a question. I think in, there are different things, but in the Middle Ages they at least created some legal tricks to get over with that and to make interest possible. And uh, muhatara was the you know, technique to get over with that. It soon became mohatra in Latin and became a, a technique used in, in, in Christian Europe as well. Uh, some scholars even think the Arabic term mudaraba, which means business partnership, was transport, transformed to trans, transport to Italy and became commenda, which is the origin of the idea of a limited company. There are other uh, concepts created, economic concepts created by Muslims and transferred again into Europe. And one of them is quite clearly, you know, in, in the way it's, you can trace its origins. That's the Arabic term sak, which means written document. 
And that was the idea that you could give some money in Morocco and get a written document. So carry the document instead of the money because it's dangerous. All the way to Baghdad and cash it again. So suck was the written document. In English it became the check. Um, actually, Fernand Braudel, the greatest, one of the greatest historians of civilizations, the great eminent French historian, says that anything in Western capitalism of important origin came from Islam. And today, in the English language, you can even just look at the language and trace some words and find their origins, actually, in this Islamic civilization. Not all of them are related to Islamic capitalism, but you, know, you can uh, see that what Muslims created in the Middle Ages and what came from that into, into the English-speaking, or actually into the whole European civilization. These words are Arabic words in English. Algebra, alchemy, alkali, almanac, amalgam, Alembic, Alco, Mask, Muslin, Tariff, Sugar, Syrup, Checkmate, Loot, and Guitar. There are, of course, also the Arabic numerals. Um, so, this was a very successful civilization in many ways. And actually, an American scholar once said, if there were Nobel Prizes, like in the year 1000, all would go to Muslims because of all the discoveries in medicine and science and astronomy and all that. Of course, Muslims learned from previous civilizations, like Greek civilization and Chinese civilization, but they also created a synthesis. And this synthesis was especially flourishing in the more cosmopolitan centers of Islam, like where? Like Baghdad. First in Damascus, but then Baghdad. In Kufa, in, in Basra. Uh, in, in southern Spain, which was called Andalusia at the time. Whereas in the more desert-based areas of Islam, you, had, you did not have this trade and the vitality and the dynamism coming from that. And it is not an accident that the more liberal and rational strains of Islamic thought flourished in these dynamic areas that I mentioned, whereas the more austere, radical, literalist schools of thought emerged from the desert, basically from the Arabian desert. Uh, and you can see that, for example, in the Sunni tradition, the Hanafi school is the most flexible than liberal school as it is compared. It, it was rooted in Baghdad, and Kufa and Baghdad. Uh, but the most rigid and literalist uh, school, the Hanbali school, which later became the Wahhabi school in, in today's Saudi Arabia, that originated in the desert. And, and the mindset, I think, of those people were influenced by the way you know, they were facing, by the, real, by the physical reality they were facing. Well, in the, again, just in the, the medieval Islamic civilization, there was not... And uh, uh, Maxim Rodinson used this term. He says Islam created financial capitalism in the Middle Ages. There was also a theory of it created by Ibn Khaldun, the famous uh, 14th century scholar. Uh, from uh, North Africa. Ibn Khaldun uh, is an interesting figure. He's sometimes people refer to him as the founder of sociology. Uh, he wrote a famous book called Muqaddima, which means introduction, and it was an introduction into history in the way he understood it. And he basically studied the role of geography in the shaping of cultures. And he actually emphasized what I just mentioned. He said, in the desert, you have a harsh, you know, more harsh, warlike tribes. In the cities, because of trade and wealth and luxury, people tend to come softer and more liberal. Then the wild tribes come and occupy the, you know, cities. But a few generations later, they, you know, you know, adopt to the city culture, and you know, this cycle goes on. So he just observed what is going on, and he created a history, a theory of history out of that, which is very interesting. But one of his most important contributions was also his, his study of, the, of economics. Uh, in his Muqaddima, he, he kind of, you can find the traces of a free market economy theory. First of all, he says, uh, in, he says in kingdoms where the government produces stuff, uh, those kingdoms are not successful. He says the merchants, and the, and the private business people should produce that, and the state should not be in, in production. He says the state's goal is to make the, the merchants and the market is free. He also says that 
in, in kingdoms where the state takes too much tax, uh, that, that kingdom becomes much poorer because people do fear from the state and do not have much activity to do. So he basically defines a low tax free market economy. And it's not an accident that uh, the World Bank a few years ago referred to Ibn Khaldun as the forerunner, as the forefather of the idea of privatization. So, uh, all this, again, to economic activity was linked with some of the more liberal strains in Islam. And that's a different matter, but I just want to mention a few things. There were two important early schools in Islamic thought. One was the Mutazilites. Uh, these are also known as the rationalists, and they flourished in Baghdad and ba Basra, the more vital places in Islam, in which Muslims faced Greek philosophy in, in Jewish Kabbalah, in Christian uh, priests, and in Hindu philosophy. So it was a more cosmopolitan world. So the Mutazilites flourished there. They were the early rationalists of Islam, and they said, revelation is from God, but our reason is also from God and we should use reason and revelation in together to find the truth. And they even said if there were no revelation, we would find what is true with our reason. Uh, by, we could establish that, you know, theft is bad with reason, even if the revelation did not tell us. Revelation only confirms that and tells us things we wouldn't know, like afterlife. On the other hand, there was the literalist, non-rationalist, even anti-rational school, which said, no, no, something is bad only when God bans it. So theft is bad only God, because God says so in the scripture. So you cannot use reason to establish anything. So that's the other, the opposite school. And today in the Muslim world, you still have the, you know, conflict, the, the clash of these different schools. The only problem is that the literal school today, which is represented by Saudi Arabia, has the biggest oil wealth in the world, and they finance lots of schools uh, all, across the, you know, all across the globe. There was another school called Murjiites, and I think that's very important for the general principle of freedom in Islam. The Murjiites, they're known in English as the postponers. And the word postpone comes from their conviction that the, all important decisions about theology should be postponed to God in afterlife, because you could not have the ultimate truth. And this came as a reaction to a very rigid school called another school called Harijites. The Harijites were basically saying that who doesn't agree with us are infidels and we're going to kill them. They were the first radical, violent uh, school uh, like movement in Islamic history. Very marginal but violent, a bit similar to the radicals of today. Uh, so they were arguing that they have an ex you know, access to truth nobody has, and, but they they have it. But the Murjiites, which again flourished in the more you know, cosmopolitan centers of Islam, said, no, God knows who's ultimately through, and we cannot judge today, so we should postpone the judgment to afterlife. So they, they, so they created an idea of a pluralism uh, under which a theocracy would not be possible, because since you cannot have ultimate access to truth, you cannot say this is the truth and accept, you know, establish a theocracy based on that. Well, I mean, and this was, of course, the uh, medieval Islamic civilization. And the thing is, there are many interesting debates and discussions among those early Muslims. Some of them are, most of them are gone or forgotten, unfortunately, because, because something became the orthodoxy. And that orthodoxy you know, became unquestioned after some, after some time. Uh, and the, the fact that the orthodoxy was formed more by the literalist and the traditionist school has again something to do with the decline of trade and economic prosperity in the Muslim world. That began with the Mongol conquests, which were disastrous, uh, which destroyed a lot of agriculture and even, even books and libraries and big part of Islamic civilization, a very disastrous event in the 13th century and, the, and then the Crusades. But the big, big change and the big decline for Islam was the change in world trade routes. When Magellan turned the Cape of Hope and you know, found a way from the oceans to India, the world changed forever. Soon the, the Middle East and even the Mediterranean started to decline as Northern Europe, the, you know, Poland and then later Britain, uh, started to flourish. And you know, because oceans became the world's you know, uh, new, new source of wealth and trade and then dynamism and open-mindedness and activity and all that. Whereas even Italy, 
you know, started to stagnate. But even before that, the, the Islamic Middle East. So, it's, the problem was not that there are not right ideas in Islam. Them. The problem was that the context was not very helpful. Uh, and the change of con context uh, made the West prosper. And, you know, of course, they had right ideas as well, as Max Weber showed in, in his famous thesis about the origin of capitalism in Europe, but also the right context. And the context was not favorable to Islam after you know, the 14th and 15th centuries, as for sure. So the Ottoman Empire was the latest, the last, you know, strongest Muslim power, and it was uh, it was based on the idea of law. And a, a, and I agree with Professor Stone that it's the fact that it was successful was not just because it continued the Byzantine traditions, which had something to explain, but also because it had the idea of a Sharia, a law, and, you know that constrained the Sultan and created a, a legal system uh, and, and, and a tradition of a state. Uh, but as we all know, the Ottoman Empire, despite its successes, failed to create the economic activity, the success uh, that uh, the West had. It is said that the, one of the latest Ottoman Sultans, Sultan Abdul Hamid, one of the most important ones, once said that, I wish our forefathers were uh, more into trade than you know, war and conquest. Because the Ottoman Empire basically suffered the lack of a dynamic bourgeoisie. Uh, and they realized that towards the end and brought new laws about you know, freeing trade and so on and promoting trade in, 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 a, in a middle class and a bourgeoisie class, but it was too late. Now, one thing, I think I'm running out of time. Okay. Three more minutes, that's good. What happened in the 20th century is a worse story because we know what happened. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire was what we call the Middle East today. Uh, from its ashes, 28 different nation states emerged, and you're in just one of them, Turkey. Uh, most of them, almost all of them were colonized. Uh, and the colonizers were looking down upon the uncivilized peoples. And what, what, what you have when you have colonization? You have anti-colonization, which becomes an ideology, which becomes a culture, which becomes a spirit. And then came the reaction to Israel and all that. This led the whole Arab world in the 20th century, almost the whole Arab world, into nationalism, socialism, a combination of that, which ultimately took a new form in the name of Islamism. That sort of third worldist, anti-Western, reactionary Islamism is not the only political manifestation of Islam. It is a particular manifestation of Islam born out of this context. But is there a different example? Yes and that is coming up in Turkey. Turkey was never colonized. Turkey had a chance to establish its own democracy, despite its troubles inside, and a very imperfect democracy for many reasons. But Turkey also has been able to, in the past three decades, two, even two decades, flourish, help flourish something that we can call an Islamic capitalism again. Today, right now, Turkey, we are speaking about the rise of a Muslim bourgeoisie rise of an entrepreneurial Muslim middle class. These are devout businessmen who look at Prophet Muhammad and not emphasize his warrior side, which is, which is a part of his legacy, but emphasize his businessman side. Recently, a German think tank wrote a report about Turkey's Muslim Calvinists. And they said their spirit is just like the you know, early Calvinists in their, the way that Max Weber defined and their attitude towards business making. Very pious, very conservative not heathenist at all, making a lot of money and spending it for charity and schools and, you know, and sending their kids to nice schools in the West and so on. And that is creating an interesting new culture in Turkey in which Islam is seen as something which encourages, first of all, economic activity and second, even individualism. Uh, and there are lots of, you know, uh, examples in Turkish society on that. Uh, one, w just one example that I can mention, one of the actually conservative Islamic thinkers a few uh, months ago in his column was criticizing this new upper class Muslims, the, the you know, Starbucks coffee drinking, hat scarf wearing, this new type of uh, girls and you know, that whole subculture. He was saying, they speak about not Quran and obedience, but they speak about Quran and freedom. And I think that's the right message and that's the way to go. Thank you so much.